first of our announcements, I would like to tell you that we have several very good members, Don and Mary Frisbee, Peter and Harriet Watson, Kaiser Permanente, and an anonymous donor who has given a gift in honor of Tom Deering. And they've issued a challenge that if anyone who makes a contribution by June 15th, your donation will be matched dollar for dollar up to $10,000, which would really be helpful to us this year in getting us over the top of our uh, fundraising goal. Because of all of the new things that we've done this year, we're just on the edge a little bit. So any contribution you can make will be matched dollar for dollar. And thank you in advance. There are contribution envelopes on your table. Coming up at City Club, one of our many events, you can tour the Tillamook Forest on June 11th. Our Citizen Salons fundraiser dinner discussion series have begun, and many of them are already sold out. So, closer to the mic will help. Okay, thank you. Maybe if I move the mic, oh my. Beware of television going when you're trying to move a mic. Now, we are also in the middle of our annual membership drive, and we would be delighted to welcome any of you who are not members as new members. And if you sign up today, the $25 new member fee will be waived. And that should be a pretty good incentive, but in addition to that, if you require more incentive, if you sign up today, you will be welcome to go to the new membership party, which will be held on the roof of Jack's Restaurant on Bar on June 9th. So sign up today, and. We'll see you there. Now, our sponsors this quarter have been Pope and Talbot, Providence Health Systems, and Zimmer, Gunsel, and Frasca. We are continually grateful for the support of our sponsors because they underwrite our, our broadcast. So thank you very much. And thank you for thanking them. So we're going to move swiftly today, and I would at first like to introduce Wendy Rodmacher Willis, who is our extraordinarily talented executive director, under whose leadership the club has taken new and exciting directions this year, as evidenced by the many new programs and guests that we've enjoyed in the past year. It would be very, very difficult to measure Wendy's actual activities against her job description, because she so far exceeds those expectations. Her intelligence, energy, vision, creativity, and compassion have carried us into the 21st century version of the City Club, and I know that the Founding Fathers would be thrilled and delighted. So let me introduce to you Wendy Rodmacher-Willis. staff began this year um, at a retreat and we asked ourselves the question, if part of City Club's mission is to arouse in its members a realization of the obligations of citizenship, then what are those obligations? We often think of our obligations as workers and parents and even as friends and partners, but outside of voting we don't often speak about the obligations of citizenship. We left the retreat really with many of those questions unanswered. But we did have one central kernel of a response, and it was, we don't have, really have an opinion about what we want, we want for ourselves and our fellow citizens, but our highest hope for them is that we all be engaged in public life somehow and in some way. And we've considered that beginning of an answer throughout the whole year, the board and the staff and everyone involved in the club. How do we engage ourselves and our neighbors in thinking about and working toward our collective future? What is it that brings us here, week after week, year after year? What draws citizens out, spending time away from our jobs and our families and friends to come into the public square? I now have a current theory. My operating theory is that the animating principle of citizenship, the kind of citizenship that City Club wants to inspire, and in fact does inspire, is curiosity. So while we may not know exactly what our obligations are, I can see in all of you a kind of civic spark that keeps the Republican form of government alive. We live in an era of received information. Everything we hear and see and read and even eat is heavily processed. 
Someone else, whether it's a member of the media or a campaign consultant, tells us what and how we should think about the issues. Words like branding and messaging, and now I guess even framing, have become part of common parlance. A kind of passivity takes over when we're spoon-fed political baby food. Everything's heavily tested, processed, soft, inoffensive. It becomes a kind of banana rice cereal in a jar. In the face of a dominant culture of tightly controlled and then regurgitated information, City Club is actually subversive. City Club encourages citizens, all of us, to criticize, to experiment with ideas that we might later discard, but that hold some kernel of important thinking. As I see it, all of this is driven by a deep curiosity to understand our culture, our community, and ourselves better. I do have to share with you one of my favorite moments of last year. As probably most of you know, City Club is dark during the month of August. We earn the good weather that we get, and so we, we sort of succumb to the hot afternoons of August and we don't meet. But last August, we made a couple of exceptions. One of them was to re host retired Senator Slade Gorton when he was out on the road presenting the findings of the Bipartisan 9-11 Commission. Senator Gorton gave a very well-packaged, very thoughtful presentation summarizing the Commission's findings. And then it was time for questions. And not surprisingly, the first question posed to Senator Gorton was, Senator Gorton, after the thorough job that you and the other members of the Commission did in examining the events of 9-11-2001, can you tell us whether you found a connection between the terrorist attacks of that day and the government of Iraq? Senator Gorton replied, good question. Then he prepared to give a long reply full of reassurances but empty of any actual answers to the question. Several other City Club members got in line and asked many probing questions of Senator Gorton and got good answers. And eventually Arnold Kogan, who many of you know, got to the front of the mic. Arnold leaned forward and very softly and very politely but firmly said, Senator Gorton, I'm going to ask you this question again. Was there a relationship between the government of Iraq and the event and the attacks of 9-11? And for a heartbeat, this room was totally silent. Senator Gorton took the second chance that he was given and answered the question a little more directly. It felt like a moment where we were all in the White House press corps. We got a chance to really ask a question, and when it wasn't answered, we got to ask it again. And for me, this re represented the curiosity that animates a truly engaged citizen. And before I finish, I do ha I have one more story I need to tell you about this year that I think sort of encapsulates the year. I think this is probably the most you know, interesting, spontaneous, and su maybe surprising event in American politics this year. It came during the Candidates Gone Wild co uh, debate co-sponsored by the New Leaders Council. The moderator, if you can call Dario O'Neill moderator in the traditional sense, asked the city council and mayoral candidates what in their lives they would give up if elected. The first candidate sort of predictably said, jaywalking. The second candidate, a little more daringly, replied, swearing. Now this is where the curiosity comes in. Daria says, okay then, what is your favorite swear word? And this particular candidate, who will remain nameless at this forum, leaned over and stage whispered a word that I have never heard in polite company. And in fact, I most certainly have never heard it before at a live house of 700 people and eight hot TV cameras. I tell you the story not because I'm somehow trying to promote swearing among political candidates, but to highlight this profoundly human moment in a setting where real people have the chance to get close to those who seek to lead us. Kismet happens. Citizenship was and is raw and it's gritty. Rather than hearing processed, processed answers to questions we would never really have asked, we can look directly at the hard problems we face together and the solutions we might offer. There's a human scale and an unpredictability that reminds us that this, our communal life, is a shared endeavor that we all have some part in. As we reflect on the past year and look with anticipation to the next, I'm profoundly grateful to all of you, the board, the staff, and all of the members, and all of those who came before us in this great organization for your intrepid commitment to preserving that spark of civic curiosity. Thank you.
Well, you can see why she's so good. All she has to do is stand up in front of you and say a couple of words and it just spews forth. Now it is time to commence with the recognition of the members of the club whose exemplary service has provided outstanding leadership. We'll begin by recognizing the outgoing issue committee chairs, and as I announce their names, I would ask each of them to approach the stage from this side, come up, shake hands, and get your certificate, and smile for the crowd. Smile in case mom's watching. Marcus Samantle and Heather Kometz has served as co-chair, sharing oversight of the club's issue committees, uh, and I'd like to recognize, first of all, Sam Pardue, who's the uh, outgoing chair of the Arts and Culture Committee. He, was served, he served for the years 2003 to 2005. Next, I'd like to recognize Tom Putnam of the Growth Management and Environment Committee. He also served from 2003 to 2005. All these people just did great jobs and did uh, spent so many hours and helped inform so many people on these subjects that we're very grateful to them. Tom? I'm not very good at this. And finally, Michael Ponder, we would like to recognize. Michael has been the chair of the Education and Human Development um, Issue Committee for the last two years. And are you continuing? You, he is not. I was wondering. There was some, some buzz about this. So anyway, Michael Ponder. Thank you, Thank you so much. Mom. <laughs> now, uh, we would like to recognize the outgoing research board members, one of whom, the stellar chair, Tamsin Wassell, she served as chair of the research board and as vice president of the Board of Governors. She will introduce the outgoing research board members, but first I would like to present her with a plaque for her extremely intelligent leadership, oversight, and guidance of the research board and the research study committees. Tamsin? Oh, can you see me over there? Um, it's been a privilege to be part of the research board, uh, particularly this past year with uh, such a great group of people who are willing to do hard work. And we're losing uh, two of those people uh, today and, and unfortunately have lost one earlier this year that I will mention um, in passing, though I think we'll talk more about Tom Deering in a minute. But um, being on the research board really does require a lot of effort. You have to read all those reports, usually several times. If you're assigned to a, a, to a, a committee to, as a research liaison, then you're going to all of their meetings. You're sweating through whether they're keeping on track and keeping on schedule. Uh, on the other hand, I think that I know for myself, it's a wildly uh, a satisfying experience to be that close to the information that really is about the true spirit of our civic engagement. So I'd like to recognize two of our members that are leaving after a three-year stint with us. Um, the first one being De Denise Bauman. She came to the research board because uh, she had been on the billboard regulation study and had done such a good job that we were able to snag her for a three-year term onto the research board. While she was a member of the research board, she was an advisor on Measure 34 and on the education finance study. And as a matter of fact, we've roped Denise into kind of staying with that uh, group just to do a final reading of their draft as it comes out. So I want to thank Denise and, and have her come up for her award. Our next uh, member who has done lots of work for us is uh, Tim Hemstreet, and he had served on two ballot measure studies, causing uh, such notice of his competency that we just had to have him on the research board. He too has served for the past three years. 
Uh, he had, was the research advisor for our noted PDC study committee. Many of you have heard of that, I'm sure. And also was research advisor to two ballot measure studies during the course of his tenure, Measure 38 and 26. Um, he's con contributed a lot to screening of, of study topics and has recently submitted a proposal to the research board uh, to look at streamlining and improving the city club's voting process. That will be something that we will be ongoingly working with even as he leaves um, his tenure. But Tim, thank you so much for your hard work. And finally, I will mention um, briefly, because we will be talking about Tom Deering more uh, later in the program, but Tom Deering also would have actually been leaving his term this year um, if he had not passed uh, just a few months ago. But he has been a incredible contributor over the years, including this was his second stint on the research board, so we guess we didn't uh, you know, scare him too badly the first time around. Um, he was the research advisor to the Education Finance Committee, which is about to publish, right, right. Doug? And, um, <laughs> uh, and also did a tremendous amount of work on the PDC study at its last uh, stages in terms of all the editing. He, he wrote many charges and study concepts and, as we know, was a very valued member. So, Tom, thanks. Thank you, Tamson. It's time now to thank our outgoing Board of Governor members. They've provided such lead leadership and insight into the decisions of the board during their respective terms of service. And it's always very bittersweet to have to say goodbye to them, at least in their capacity as board members. I'd first of all like to recognize past president, Andy Linehan, who served on the board for three years and whose thoughtful comments and enormous wisdom provided outstanding leadership during his term. We typically like to recognize a past president with a special gift, and we decided that since he so graciously shared his beautiful back garden for so many City Club events, we wanted to give him a gift that would commemorate the good times we had there. So we have given him, we are going to give to him a gift certificate to a specialty garden shop where he can find many special things to enhance that beautiful space. Andy? I'd like now to introduce our recognized, the very low key and extremely intelligent service provided by Wayne Lay on his term in the Board of Governors, but also in his service as the Secretary and Chair of the Personality, Personnel, Personality Committee. <laughs> well, we needed that. Uh, Chair of the Personnel Committee. Uh, Tom, are you here today? Or Wayne, are you here today? Well, we'll just pretend. Hi, Tom. Hi, Wayne. See you out there. Now we have Mike Burton, who I believe is here today. He served for a year as an at-large member, and in his case, that meant he was willing to be tapped for special needs, and he knew a lot of people. He knows a lot of people, and he was always willing to step up to the plate and help us out. So Mike is not here today, so hi, Mike. Hi, Wayne. Next is Heather Kometz. She was first instrumental in originating the new Leaders' Council and later went on to co-chair the oversight of the issue committee. And although Heather is a tax attorney, she would have gotten an A-plus in any litigation class for the articulate presentation of her points of view, which are always very intelligent, I might add. Heather. And finally, but certainly not last, is Marcus Samantel. He had the official title of co-chairing the issue committee's oversight, but in addition, he made significant contributions during his term of service on the board by bringing the experience of a longtime activist and semi-retired radical to the discussions. Marcus?
And now we come to the time for our special awards. We have, uh, the first is a research award in recognition of its drive for excellence and commitment to fairness in research. If that were not so, we would not have access to almost anyone when you pick up the telephone. The award this year goes to the members of the study, which has engendered enormous attention and triggered changes within an important governmental body. And that research study was entitled Portland Development Commission, Governance, Structure, and Process. I'd like to first recognize Sue Thomas, who chaired that committee. And I'd like to ask each of the members to come up uh, in order. Sue, if you would begin, please. Next is Marilyn Elbers, Anne Marie Clare, Lynn Coward, Clyde Doctor, Vern Fox, Paul Fellner, Kurt Kraus, David Mandel, Paul Manson, Paul Meyer, and Fred Phillips. Thank you all so much for your excellent work. confusion up here. It wouldn't be an award ceremony. All oh, right. I will recognize Jake Okenberg, who is serving a stellar role as presenting the certificates to the research, mem the research study chair members. All right. Moving right along, I'd like to also recognize Tim Hemstreet and Chuck Stuckey, who served as research advisors. And of course, Wade Fickler, the, our own City Club Research Director, in his usual role as superior being in helping everybody get all of these done and out in time. Now, our Member of the Year Award is for Outstanding Contribution to the Club in Advocacy. The recipient of that award this year is Clyde Doctor, who has virtually become known as Mr. Affordable Housing in Portland. He chaired the research study on affordable housing, and then with the energy created by conviction, he made the natural segue into advocacy for the results of the study. He's been instrumental in effective coalitions at both the city and state level, and one of the co coalitions, the Affordable Housing Con Coalition Now, was successful in convincing the city to refund $11 million to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund last year. And he's particularly effective in this advocacy effort because City Club is often the only organization advocating that is not a recipient of funds. Clyde also works to ensure the message of City Club's report that rental vouchers, as opposed to capital construction, should be a big part of the solution to affordable housing. And he wants to make sure that that is not forgotten in any of the coalitions. So Clyde, I know you're here. Well, hi, Clyde. I know he's here. I saw him earlier, but um, we'll have him replay these comments over and over again to his family. Now, finally, uh, one of our major awards that is not necessarily given annually, but only when we think that there is a particularly um, worthy recipient is the City Club Award. And the City Club Award this year is for, the, it is the highest award that the club offers for outstanding contribution to the club and the community and for setting an example of inspired leadership. This year, the award goes to Tom Deering, but much to our great regret, it is awarded posthumously. Tamson recognized his role in many of the research activities. And you will note the award is for contribution to community as well as City Club. For many years, Tom was an attorney at Stoll Reeves, where he founded the firm's employees' benefits practice, becoming a nationally recognized expert in the field. Tom was also a leader in the community, where among his many other activities, he was a champion of civil liberties through the American Civil Liberties Union, and supporter of the arts, was instrumental in establishing Pacific Northwest College of the Art. He had a profound and long-lasting effect in the City Club, which he joined in 1958. Over the years, he served several terms on the club's Board of Governors, Research Board, the 2000 Debate Task Force, and 1966 Committee on Club Action. He also served on three study committees, 
helped organize a program on the 2003 ballot measure on about refinancing the PERS debt. He assisted in the review of the 2005 report on the Portland Development Commission and was helping guide the club's current education and finance study committee. At the time of his death, Tom was also providing his considerable pension fund expertise to the design of an upcoming City Club study of Portland's Fire and Police Disability and Retirement Fund. Tom will be greatly missed. So, hi Tom. I have a couple of other awards that are only awarded periodically, again, when at the President's um, urging and nomination, there are special people that the President believes deserve such awards. This year, I will be giving two of those awards. The first one will be going to Don Williams, who's been a member since 1972. Don, are you here today? There he is, good. Hello. Don has served as chair of the research board and as secretary to the Board of Governors, but he was particularly helpful this year. He's done yeoman's work for the club because of the interest and excitement he held about moving into the new space. He provided tremendous personal and professional energy in fundraising for the space, and he worked tirelessly to convince people to contribute money to match the challenge money, and he clearly was successful in his efforts. He's a welcome visitor when he drops by the City Club Commons, which he helped create, for a cup of coffee and a visit with staff and members. So please thank Don Williams with me. Finally, uh, my second President's Award goes to Nikki Lynch. <sighs> Nikki was a broker at Merrill Lynch and became a club member in 1987. With typical enthusiasm and skill, she proceeded to serve on the membership committee, more than one annual funds committee, and worked on various study committees. Having demonstrated her leadership capabilities, she went on to several leadership roles in the club, serving twice on the Board of Governors, chairing the research board, and most recently as chair of the program committee. I am sorry, but hey, I'm a Pisces. What do you expect when you elect a president who's a Pisces, huh? <laughs> her lengthy service demonstrated her leadership skills and how devoted she was to the club. But that doesn't flesh out how Nikki the woman led. She was very smart and creative. She was energetic and motivated, and she motivated others. She was very, very funny and had a wry sense of humor, very dry sense of humor. Nikki succumbed this week to a long bout with cancer. All of those who had the privilege of working with her know they were enriched by the experience. The Bill Nato Company has very generously donated $5,000 to the City Club in her memory. We're very grateful to them and grateful that we got to share part of her life. So here's to you, Nick. As my last official act as City Club President, I will proceed with the election of the 2005-2006 introduction of the Board of Governors. Returning officers and governors are Bill Kramer, Treasurer. Bill is not here today. Gwen Milius, who will continue to chair the New Leaders Council. And Chris Smith, who will become an at-large member after serving for several years as the chair of Advocacy and Awareness Committee. Under Chris's passionate leadership, this important work of the club has truly come of age. 
He was instrumental in designing a structure for the advocacy and awareness subcommittees and devising a reporting method to the Board of Governors who, believe me, were very tough on him a lot of times, but he persevered. And he will be mentoring Kristen Green in this role as she joins the Board of Governors this year. So Chris, I'd like to award you a certificate of appreciation for your leadership in the advocacy and awareness program. I'd also like to recognize Jake Okenberg, who will be continuing in uh, his role on the Board of Government, and he will be continuing in his capacity as chair of the membership committee. He's doing an excellent job, and we are absolutely thrilled to have him with all of his energy. And uh, Norma Paulus, who I believe is not here today, she will also be continuing in an, in an at-large role. And we'll now, let me think, I do believe, don't I have some awards back here for, let me check, just a second. Nope, we're fine. We, we have a whole little stack of them here, but they were for people who were not here to collect them. All right, now with the election of the 2005-2006 officers and governors, President will be Doug Marker, President-elect Susan Hammer, First Vice President Andy Sloop, down here, Secretary Tamsin Wassell, and K Carla Kelly will uh, chair the program committee, Ron Paul will chair the issues committee, Kristen Green, who is not here, as I said, will be chairing the Advocacy and Awareness Committee, and Chip Lazenby, who also was not able to join us, will be an at-large member. The above nominees have been selected by the club's nominating committee according to the bylaws. And there is also a mechanism in the bylaws which allows other nominations. They come from the membership. They, uh, it provided that three written recommendations from club members and a signed agreement from the nominee is submitted within 10 days of the annual meeting. No, but no other names have been submitted for election. I therefore declare the nominees elected by unanimous consent. Congratulations. And Andy Sloop uh, chaired the committee, so thanks so much, Andy, for helping superintend this process. Oh, Brian Campbell. And he's even here. Brian will, not only has he served admirably on the research board in the past, Brian will now take over as chair of the research board. We really, next year, and we really had to do a lot of talking because he knows how much work is involved because he's been doing it for a long time. So Brian, hello. <laughs> and also, before we move on, I'd like very much to thank our exemplary staff. We've already mentioned Wendy, but I'd like to thank Cullen Brady, the guy back there in the blue shirt. He's the office manager. <laughs> And as office manager, he appears to handle the myriad of detail required for smooth operation of the club he, nearly effortlessly. And he is not going to get a sunburn because we now have a screen in front of the window so the poor man can work. Tim Kraus, back in here with a gold shirt on. He's our communications director and his expertise is clear in the bulletins and written materials and on the website. So he does an excellent job at that. And Wade Fickler, who was our research director, as mentioned before, his patience and intelligent guidance, his editing skills and good humor ensure the publication of excellent research reports. So there's Wade. Thank you, Wade. <laughs> and now just a few closing remarks from me before I turn over the gavel, so to speak, to, it's, a, it's just a virtual gavel, actually, to, uh, to Doug. Uh, I'm just thinking what a whirlwind of a year when I got ready to write these. Um, during the past 12 months, we've moved into new ground floor space in the park blocks, which as most of you, I hope, have had an opportunity to see it. And we've partnered with Cafe Voila to provide food and drink for the dozens of meetings that are held in our large meeting space dubbed City Club Commons. 
We've implemented a number of new programs and partnering event, events, including Citizens Read, the Illahee Post Lecture Discussions, Multnomah County Budgeting Process, the Slow Food Movement, and many, many more. And we've also developed a new look by adopting a version of the Skidmore Fountain as our logo. It was chosen in part for its distinctive classical look and because the fountain was built as a meeting place for people and their animals, and its inscription, Good Citizens Are the Riches of a City, which exemplifies the club's belief, as written in our mission statement, to inform its members in the community and public matters and to arouse in them a realization of the obligations of citizenship. Wendy dealt with that briefly in her comments. But as I stood before you just a year ago and talked about the meaning of the mission statement then and how the club is constantly guided by it, and I quoted one of our recent speakers who said, the power of ideas can change a community. We've been hard at work in that regard, and I think we've done a marvelous job because literally thousands of people have been reached by the club's programs in the past year. Nearly, nearly 7,500 people attended the Friday forums and countless others listened to it or saw it on cable television. Our research reports and ballot measure studies ge generated enormous media interest, which led to thousands more citizens becoming informed on these vital matters. Members of the advocacy and awareness committees reached numerous policymakers and encouraged them to implement the club's positions. And the new leaders council meets with dozens at after hours meetings and brings new faces and new leaders into the club. The citizens read book discussions have been so popular that 300 people had to make reservations to attend and unfortunately many others were turned away. And another 170 attended our sold out series of citizen salons. Providing leadership opportunities is one of the important roles played by the club and our members were provided with ample opportunities this year. Approximately 200 members were involved in research or on one of the six issue committees. And another 40 or more participate in advocacy and awareness activities. The program committee members find their calls are always returned when they're working to set up the excellent programming. Time doesn't allow me to recognize the countless other citizen volunteers who work to inform themselves as well as the community and to provide a meeting place for those of similar interests and our membership has increased substantially this year. We will continue these efforts, and I'm committed to reach out even more to expand the message of good citizenship to communities of people who are currently underrepresented in our membership. We will continue to build bridges. And I want to say that I am so proud and privileged and honored to have served as your president this year and to engage with so many bright, committed people who are dedicated and energetically making an effort to provide good citizenship and given their efforts to the community at large. So, thanks for the memories. One more time. So I have to say I've taken a special interest in watching Corlene this year because I've always thought that you know, next year I have to do that and watch how she did. But Corlene, uh, I hope everyone realizes, has led the club through an exciting period of change. And um, it was recognized this morning in the Portland Tribune about just what a dynamic new organization. Sorry. What a dynamic new organization we are. Is that okay? Thanks. That's right. I'm a little bit taller than the other folks. But it, is a, it has been an exciting year of change, and Corlene has led the club with a dedication to um, increasing the club's diversity, to watching the, um, the, st the strength of our strategic plan, and maintaining a commitment to programming that has served us extremely well. And it's been an exciting year with Corlene's leadership. So Corlene, in recognition of your service, I have one more plaque with a real gavel. <laughs> which <It's> heavy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Wow. Thank you, thank you. The last time I got a standing ovation was when I was a senior in high school and I was a cheerleader. <laughs> and believe me, she's still a cheerleader. Um, Ketzel, we will, we will provide an opportunity for you to speak. <laughs> I just wanted to add my thanks to Wendy and the staff, uh, add my thanks to Corleen, and express my excitement at working with such a dynamic board. And I have to remember to keep speaking into the microphone. Um, for me, City Club has been a place um, where I've found um, lifelong friendships. And um, Wendy speaks of the City Club as bringing Oregon citizens together in a dense web of relationships that is the foundation of civic engagement. And I found that to be true because we form relationships here outside of our work lives. And yet these, these, this web of relationships is what sustains our ability to be leaders in Oregon and um, bring, bring together new generations of leaders in Oregon. And I'm very proud of the organization for that. Normally, the president of City Club announces a vision for the year, but the past presidents who've been recognized here in Coraline um, have really worked over the last few years to lead the club in a new direction that I feel committed, I am committed, to maintain. We have a strategic plan that is a long-term goal. We have a commitment to a new vision for civic engagement in this community, and we want to have 3,000 members in three years. And I am, find myself in the position of leading the club in the continuation of that effort. And I'm, Wendy, very committed to that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Um, you've heard about all the exciting achievements of this year, and I, I can only hope to be here next year, um, having realized even more of this. So thank you very much. I forgot to introduce you. I forgot to introduce you. That's okay. I'm Doug Marker, by the way. Um, to our program. <laughs> Ketzel Levine, most of us know and are, are familiar with from her long career on NPR. And she began when Morning Edition began, which I didn't realize because I started, I found Morning Edition by accident in 1979 and have been listening to it ever since. And Ketzel had earlier worked with the BBC. Um, and she's, her career has gone through a number of changes. Um, the one we're most familiar with is that she left NPR um, to study horticulture and then with that brought it back um, to her um, programming as the doyen of dirt, which she is no longer the doyen of dirt, she asked me to say. And she's moved on to be the senior correspondent for, a senior correspondent for Morning Edition um, with a new and exciting array of programming. Um, Ketzel has um, focused on uh, changes in people's lives and evo evolutions in their careers and their pursuits. And she's probably already engaged in a new pursuit sitting here waiting for us to finish with the awards. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a great privilege to um, introduce Ketzel Levine as our program guest. Forgive me, I'm directing a couple of friends to sit right in front of me. I have a nice, friendly little cushion over there. Not that you aren't friendly people. The last time I stood here, uh, my ragtag collection of new friends were incredulous that I, of all people, had been asked to address the City Club of Portland. What are you going to say to the City Club of Portland, they asked. You're still driving around with out-of-state plates. Well, one of the many miracles of the last nine years, which is how long it's been since I addressed you, one of the many miracles you're going to hear all about is that not only am I registered with my motor vehicle, so is my sister, Susan Levine, who moved here in 2003, and so is my mother, Rosalind Levine, who arrived here seven months ago. Mom and Suze, would you mind standing up, please? My mother is a born and bred New Yorker. This is her first experience living out of state, unless you could count a short stint in New Jersey. And at the risk of embarrassing her terribly, I would wager that you could count the number of her non-Jewish, non-New York friends on maybe two hands. One of the best lines I've heard since she's got here, she lives at the Holiday Park Plaza in Northeast Portland, was this, 
Who knew that Protestant ministers could be so funny and so liberal? <laughs> My sister came here from Berkeley, so her transition was pretty seamless. She is now part of the rejuvenation taking place on Southeast Division, having added to the beauty of the street enormously with a new home and a new gallery called Metal Urges where she sells her own astonishingly clever and colorful artwork. And it turns out the sales staff is my mother. <laughs> so on behalf of the entire Levine family, there's one more sister who's not here. She likes good bagels, sun sunshine, and people who can dress way too much to move here. Uh, we invite you to stop by to my sister's gallery at 36th and Division any weekend and say hello. Okay, here's a speech. It's about my Portland and maybe it sounds familiar to you. The other night I did this incredibly stupid thing and I stuck a light bulb into an overhead socket that I couldn't actually reach. So the live end of the bulb made contact and there was this very ominous is that how you did it, Tom? And all the lights in the kitchen went off. And I might add that these aren't just any lights. These are lights made of upside down coffee pots. I bought the house this way. And my hunch, my fear, was that the artist I bought the house from did the wiring herself. Anyway, I needed an electrician. And I decided to track down the guy that I used five years ago when I bought my first home. Oh, I'm sorry, when I first bought my home. I've only had one home in Portland. Um, I went through the yellow pages, dubious that I would remember his business name, but after several pages, there it was. And a woman answered, and I told her I'd done business with them five years ago and was glad that they were still around. So she asked her my name, and I just about get out the Quetzal part, and she says, I don't believe this. I just left Dig Magazine, that's a Lake Oswego-based magazine for Northwest Gardeners, I saw you a few months ago at Garden Fever, that's a small nursery off of Northeast Fremont. I've just bought this electric company, and if we're doing work at your house, I'm coming over. <laughs> well, I'm here to say that despite all the changes I've seen this metropolis go through in the last nine years, the herds of newcomers bidding our house prices off the charts, the escalating number of Starbucks, Walgreens, Regals, Cinemas, and embarrassing as it is Humvees, this place is still just a small town, and it's filled with people who love knowing that they know you, or know someone who knows you, or know someone who used to know someone you knew. <laughs> All this excitement about paths crossing and friends mixing is just for the delicious coincidence of it all. A web of connection, and I was delighted that you used that term, that affirms nothing more than we are all here together. I would really like some feedback about the sound of this. Is it better when I step back so that it's not as boomy? No, okay. I hasten to add with some nostalgia for New York, where knowing someone who knows someone might at least get you a discount that the excitement over sharing Planet Portland does not usually get you any deals. But I have come to enjoy that too because the implication is that we are all similarly terrific for just knowing one another and that while all this knowing may not save us any money, it can turn a mundane transaction into a warm and an affirming connection. All of which leads me to the talk I gave here nine years ago to this month a talk I miraculously found in a file upstairs, which turns out to be about why I came to Portland. And if I might quote the person I was back then, and I guarantee you, if I didn't have her notes, I wouldn't have remembered much about her, those nine years having landed me squarely in my brain fart 50s, she told you this. I came out here wanting a great deal from this city, I came here starved for a sense of place, a place where I could belong." End quote. Where I got my optimism from, I have no idea. 
why I thought a physical environment rather than an internal calm could provide me with a sense of place, I have no idea, and why I thought Portland, a place I knew nothing, absolutely nothing about, could provide me with such a place, I had no idea. But damn it all if I wasn't right. Today I belong in some of the unlikeliest of Portland places. One of my favorites is my Wi-Fi coffee shop, the Fresh Pot on Mississippi, where I have the distinction, yeah, where I have the distinction of being one of the resident Alta Cockers, or to put it more nicely than it's meant to be one of the elders there. It is an act of faith for me to walk in there every day and interact with all these young, disheveled, and therefore inherently hip people, <laughs> particularly the sweet guys behind the counter, any of whom I would love to date if I wasn't two decades too late, <laughs> forcing me on a daily basis to face a healthy handful of my own demons, not the least of which is having achieved the distinction of invisibility, the fate of the middle-aged. But the truth is, I belong there. Even if I'm not crazy about my place in the pecking order, I have staked my claim, I am known, I am welcomed. The fresh pot is part of my community. It's also one of the latest sea change neighborhoods in this city, for those of you who have not visited us in a while. I have friends who've had greenhouses on North Mississippi since 96, so I've known both the street and the neighborhood since shortly after moving here. The changes there are now happening at such a pace that if you miss a few weeks, you really do miss a few new businesses. I haven't even gotten to the new pet store yet, and that is saying a lot. Frankly, I don't think it's my place here to discuss the pros and cons of Portland's urban renewal and its ugly spawn, gentrification. I do ask that you stay mindful and that wherever you shop, that you support local businesses. I will say that I was always inclined towards North Portland and found a sweet home there in 2000. When I saw the house, which is not far from Jefferson High School, it was being sold by its owner who happened to be working in her front yard. She invited me in, I fell in love with the place, including those coffee pot fixtures, and I immediately called my realtor, who laughed somewhat derisively when I told him the address. I am here to tell you, he ain't laughing no more. <laughs> he is also no longer my realtor. <laughs> my neighborhood has its challenges. PCC buildings now dominate Killingsworth, and while I'm all for education, I am not adverse to architecture, and these buildings are ugly. I am grateful for the requisite street trees. I guess a generous setback for more greeneries would have been too much to hope for. More seriously, I guess it doesn't get more serious, I still hear gunfire at night, and I expect to hear more of it as the weather improves. I've had occasion to be out on Killingsworth late at night in the last few months. I adopted a very rambunctious three-and-a-half-year-old dog who has a tendency to bolt, and Killingsworth is her chosen route, unfortunately. And I'm not going to pretend I felt all that safe out there at night. I don't have the statistics in front of me to support whether I was being reasonably cautious or knee-jerk paranoid. On the other hand, I did not move into Laurelhurst. I accept the trade-offs of, shall we say, a livelier neighborhood. And I admit I am not part of the solution because I haven't gotten as, vol as involved as I might have, so that's my failing. And the bottom line is that I love my neighbors far too much to ever consider leaving our street. I might also add that I can no longer afford to leave our street and buy a house as nice as mine, as nice as mine is a spiffier neighborhood. I am certain it's no surprise to you, the last nine years here in matters of real estate border on the obscene. But what blows my mind even more is when people say, well, it's not as bad as DC or the Bay Area, implying that we should even be on the same page as these seriously grown up cities. Perhaps that's my own unwillingness to admit that we are indeed increasingly major league material. And I use the sports reference loosely. I am not going anywhere near the debate of bringing major league baseball to Portland. I am willing, though, to take you with me as we commute across the Fremont Bridge, get off at Everett, 
shoot down to ninth, turn right past the Pearl Bakery. Are you with me? And start the day off with a greeting from one of the city's finest parking lot attendants, Patrick. Patrick is also part of the world I belong in. Despite the schizophrenia of the weather here, he is all sunshine with the biggest all comers welcome smile you could ever want on your ordinary everyday morning. We know almost nothing about each other. I have the advantage, I do know he's lived with his girlfriend for two years. But if you're going to share the planet with strangers, he is as good as they get. And it's inevitable that if you're going to spend any time with me as either my parking lot attendant or my listening audience, I am going to talk about dogs. And if you know me well, you will know that my beagle, Della, died recently, December 30th, as a matter of fact, 5.35 p.m. I was unable to work for at least a week after her death. I slept at my neighbor's because I couldn't bear my home without her nor could I bring myself to go to the office and have to explain to everyone on the floor why she wasn't at work. Eventually, I did resume my work routine, and that meant parking. And because Della came to work with me every day, Patrick asked after her, and I had to tell him she was gone. Life went on, one of the things I sorely hate about life. And within a month, I had another canine passenger in my back seat, the aforementioned three-and-a-half-year-old escape artist, Zoe May. I did not love her, but I needed her. And given that she'd already been through three homes, it was obvious she needed me. This will not resonate with you non-dog people. Are there any of you here? But. With Zoe made by my side, I could at least walk the city streets without skulking and wincing. It was no surprise to me that Della's constant proximity gave me courage. What took my breath away was how vulnerable I felt walking without her. It was as if she'd been surgically removed from me and I was walking around like a hideous freak with my nerves exposed. I could not stand it, and even though I knew I would resent a dog that wasn't Della, I needed a creature to place between me and the world. Zoe May, big, robust, slightly wild, very smelly, got the job. Anyway, I hadn't said much of anything to Patrick, the parking lot attendant, about what I was going through. I mean, I virtually said nothing to him. But after a few Zoe May days, the stranger from the parking garage, a guy who still has no idea what my name is, says, I hope you don't mind me saying it, but these last couple of days, it's like you're back to being alive. Patrick is Portland in all its benevolence, undemanding, non-judgmental, open-hearted, a place that by and large gives you the benefit of the doubt. I know someone who knows you, or at least knows someone you knew, so guess what? We're both here. I would like to tell you about someone who is no longer here. It was a tough day for these dead people, isn't it? Yeah. But to my endless gratitude, she was once here, and for some inexplicable reason, her own inexhaustible curiosity, I suppose, she let me into her life. I am speaking of Mary Winch, an engaging, gregarious, cantankerous, and irresistible woman. With such a huge personality, it remains one of God's great miracles that all that humanity fit into her tiny frame. Mary Winch knew everyone. Who here knew Mary Winch? <laughs> she was a lightning rod of a woman. It was a waste of time to play the I am a friend of so-and-so with her because it didn't matter to Mary. If you entered her orbit at all, you were of her orbit. Your connectedness was a given. I am not talking about a saint here, a soft, benign presence. I am talking about a 94-year-old, 94-pound force of nature. And as much light as she generated during her long reign in Portland, you would imagine that it might have gotten pretty dark around here when she died in the late fall of 2003. 
Yet amazingly enough, the connections held. I see a number of married people regularly around town, and when it happens, we all light up. Certainly, we are each bereft in our own way. For myself, I have no other friend whose house I drop by weekly, unannounced, jonesing for something chocolate and knowing I won't be disappointed. I have few other friends who are quite as wickedly witty about their distrust and contempt of our current administration, and I have a lot of those kinds of friends. I remain incredulous that if she is not somewhere in Lincoln Hall during Friends of Chamber Music concerts, I fear for the future of modern music in Portland without Mary writing letters exhorting music directors to take more risks. I miss the people in Portland I never see anymore because without her we don't share an orbit. And I must say it was a source of no small pride to be seen with her out on the town. Look who likes me, Mary Winch. Aren't I something? Mary Winch and my Della are two of the great losses I've experienced since moving here in 1996. The death of my father, Arthur Levine, Olive Hashalem, tops the list. I regret a few relationships that came to naught out here, most platonic, though one serious romance. I will admit, when I moved to the Northwest, I thought I stood a fairly good chance of finding one of those life partner people. Now I think I'm might do better in Alaska or South Dakota. <laughs> Australia may still be a possibility. This is not a great town for single, available, grown-up, heterosexual women of a certain life experience, expectation, and accomplishment. <laughs> I am not going to plumb the depths of this subject today because my mother, as you know, is in the audience and I don't want to discourage her. However, suffice it to say that despite high rolling it with the dating service, I shall simply call, it's just a nightmare. <laughs> or groveling before friends who know someone who might know someone who used to know someone 50-ish straight and single. I have decided that my life is basically too terrific to use up energy I might spend gardening or reading or, God forbid, hiking to force a reality that just ain't going to happen. And don't you dare tell me that now is exactly when it happens, because I have been listening to that song for five years. In truth, in many ways, my life is such an embarrassment of riches, if for no more illustrious reason than sheer boredom, I am not looking anymore. See me afterwards if you have any leads. <laughs> One thing I am truly not in the market for as we spin our way back to belonging is a place to work. When I last stood before you, I had just finished a six-year stint as the proprietor of a landscaping business in Washington, D.C. During that time, I also kept my hand in radio. Those were the early doyen of dirt, dirt days with Scott Simon. But that was a once-a-month gig, guys. For all intents and purposes, when I moved out here, I had left NPR. And this is what I said to you then about that organization regarding the changes that I had witnessed there. The community of discovery, of cozy rooms, rugs, and wall hangings I'd been a part of in the 70s and 80s, had become an organization of gray flanneled modules and efficiently organized space. I didn't like the change much, but it was a change that had to happen for the good of the network and ultimately for me because the new NPR hastened my need for departure." End quote. This could be eating crow, but, um, or eating tempeh, which I think is probably worse. But as you know, I am back at NPR, and I am thrilled, and I am proud to be back, more than ever. I rejoined the staff as a full-time correspondent in September 2000, and only the most cynical among you will see a link between the fact that that was the same year I bought a house and harnessed myself to a mortgage. I will not deny that self-employment, particularly as a garden writer, was wearing a little thin. 
But the fact is, I am a slave to radio. I love the medium, and I revel in the creative challenge. I also revel in the fact that my gray flannel network is 3,000 miles away, and that I work here, downtown, in a high-ceilinged office in a very reasonably priced building chock full of non-profits. My office is another place I truly belong. It is Planet Portland. One of my favorite coincidences is that the administrative office of one of my favorite places in Oregon has recently moved onto my floor, the Friends of Opal Creek. As most of you know firsthand, I hope, Opal Creek is a forest southeast of here, about two hours, contains stunning old growth stands of hemlock, dug fir, western red cedar, and Pacific yew. Last summer, I had the extraordinary good fortune to join some of the Opal Creek staff and a few professional climbers from Eugene to not only scale a 210-foot dug fir, but to spend the night up top in a hammock. That night was, without a doubt, one of the most magical and serene of my life. I cannot describe the feelings of sleeping suspended in an ancient 700-year-old creature in a tree boat hanging from massive limbs each the size of a full-grown tree. Completely swaddled in greenery with no real perspective, I experienced no fear because I had no sense of where I was. I couldn't see too far up, and thankfully I could not see down. The air was unspeakably sensual and calm. The sounds of the forest were immense and all-encompassing, and I was in awe of a sense of connectedness that only happens for many of us in the wild, which is, of course, why many of us are here. My office is a long way from such serenity. My, I look out over Burnside. And from such a uniquely singular experience, frozen in time, my office, that is, a long way. But seven months later, who should come knocking at my door, saying he's moved in down the hall, but one of the guys who slept 20 feet above me that same night, and he was the guy who snored. <laughs> I am always game for a hike. Portland, particularly in spring, is astonishing. A few months back when the chocolate lilies and other delights were still blooming in the gorge, Zoe May and I drove out the scenic highway about 20 minutes past Multnomah Falls, parked the car, traipsed, traipsed around in a woodland time warp for a few hours. At one point, we came to a classic little clearing where the light was streaming in and it was illuminating the moss and the ferns and the frothy ground covers and the densely upholstered stumps. And because it was a weekday, I only go out on weekdays, I am very spoiled, I had seen only two other people in maybe three hours of hiking. I was largely focused on botanizing that day, and I'd been flipping out totally flipping out over any number of plants that you only get to see for a few weeks each year. But this was a different kind of moment. This wasn't the jump for joy moment. This was the okay, I can die now moment. I found myself thinking, this is it. Everything else is filler. All the concerts I go to, the art I buy, the plants I grow, the novels I read, even playing piano, it's all filler. Friends too, even work. I'm at my happiest, my most grateful to be alive when I am in the woods, period. Get me out of here more than once every two weeks, get me here every day, this is who I am. Then I got home to two men I love, one of whom who has been staying with me since November, and is moving into his own home with his real partner at the end of this month. How is that for gratitude? <laughs> the other was staying with us for five weeks, back visiting after abandoning We Who Love Him for the godforsaken southeastern United States, another ingrate. The three of us are all of a pod when it comes to horticulture, so I relived my trip to the gorge with them, genus by genus. 
My house was overflowing with energy and shared pleasure, and I found myself thinking, the woods work for me because I have such amazing friends in my life. I must keep my home filled with people. This is who I am. We then piled into the car and we went to another friend's for dinner, a night that had a particularly memorable ending. As we all sat quietly around the kitchen table listening to Keith Jarrett perform Shostakovich's 24th Prelude and Fugue. I don't know all that many people who know that piece, but these friends did, and it was mind blowing to be able to share such a pro profound piece of music and such a profound piece of myself with them. And I said to myself, What am I nuts? My life has texture and resonance and beauty because of music. The woods would say nothing to me if they did not resound with Bach. Then we got home and I needed to walk Zoe May, so we went outside and who should be waiting for us but Lula, my long-haired tabby who showed up last summer in the clumping bamboo. Lula likes to walk with us if a few feet ahead. And I've always wanted to be one of those people who had a walking cat. So our evening strolls as a trio have become one of my major cheap thrills. So there we are, the three of us, walking our beautiful North Portland neighborhood. And I look down at this big, brown, hairy, smelly dog and this diminutive, fluffy cat. And I think, you know, who are these animals? When I moved out here nine years ago, I had a Rhodesian Ridgeback and a beagle. Whose family is this? And of course I start to miss Della, and I remember her last week on Planet Portland, and I know I would now do anything in the world for Dove Lewis Emergency Vet Hospital. And I think about the Shostakovich, and I realize how proud I am to be on the board of an organization as splendid as Friends of Chamber Music. And I think about the gorge and acknowledge how grateful I am to have Forest Park in my daily repertoire. Well, you get the picture. My meds were working. <laughs> but more than that, or perhaps because of that, my life was working. My life is working. I have finally achieved that elusive sense of place. I live somewhere. I live here. So I'm here to tell you, nine years later, I have a great deal of giving back ahead of me. And I hope, in the time it's taken for me to weave this web of connection, that I have managed to give something back to you. Thank you, Portland. And it looks like we're out of time think, and can't take questions. I think that's right, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but you certainly raised a lot of issues to ask you about. <laughs> I am afraid that's all the time we have uh, for our annual meeting. Thank you all for coming, and we're adjourned. <laughs>